Kuzangpo, welcome to Bhutan e-learning program. I'm Top Gye. This is a biology lesson for Key Stage 5, classes 11 and 12. In today's session, we are going to look at sexual reproduction in flowering plants. At the end of this session today, you should be able to achieve the following three objectives. You should be able to define pollination and fertilization. Number one. Number two, you should be able to state the importance of pollination and fertilization. And finally, explain the significance of double fertilization. So these are the three important objectives that we will try to fulfill at the end of this session today. I'm sure you would have seen different kinds of flowers. You may have uh, flower gardens around your home. You may also have flower gardens, gardens in your school. You might have seen the plants flowering, but did you ever wonder why do plants flower? Did this question come to your mind? Or did you take those flowers just for decoration? So as a science student, what we have to know is flower plays a very important role in the life of plants, particularly the angiosperms. So let us look at what is sexual reproduction and how the flowers are playing a very important role, a vital role in sexual reproduction of the flowering plants. We know that for fertilization to take place, there should be fusion of male and female gametes happening. So when there is fusion of male and female gametes, it results in the formation of zygote, which later develops into the offsprings, if it is in the animals, and then in the seedlings or the seeds in the plants. For any organism that is produced through sexual reproduction requires two parents. So that is why we say we are the, the product of biparental, meaning there is requirement of father and there is also requirement of mother. So this indicates that uh, the plants require the male part and the female part. So this is something that we will discuss through the session today. So we have known that the flowers are important for reproduction in the plants. And what you have to keep in your mind is not all the plants produce flower. That is why the plants are categorized into two as flowering and non-flowering plants. Those of the plant which flowers, we call it as angiosperm, while the one which do not flower, we call it as gymnosperm. Within the angiosperm, again, there are two types of plants, again, which is called as monocarpic and polycarpic. So monocarpic plants are those plants which will flower only once in their lifetime and they will die. But polycarpic plants are those plants which will flower at a regular interval every year. A monocarpic plant, you have known the definition now. Can you think of an example of a monocarpic plant? Once again, I would like to tell you that monocarpic plants are those plants which will flower once in their lifetime. Can you think of some examples? I'm sure you would have seen the sunflower in your flower garden. You might have also seen the marigold. Did you also notice the carrot flowering? All, all these are the examples of monocarpic plants, which will flower once and then die. Of course, the seed remains there. Okay, if these are the monocarpic plants, what could be polycarpic plants? It is just the opposite of monocarpic plants. Can you think of an example? I'm sure you might have seen apple flowering, an orange tree flowering, or a mango flowering, or a rhododendron flowering, so these are the plants which falls in polycarpic category because they will be flowering every year at the same time. So such plants we call it as polycarpic plant. But whatever might be the plant type, what we have to know is the plants produce flower for the purpose of reproduction. So why do you think the organisms will have to reproduce? 
No matter whether the organism is a human being or an animal or a plant, the ultimate aim of each organism is to produce the offspring in sufficient amount so that their species or their type continues generation after generation. So now, in order to understand how the reproduction is happening in the flowering plant, it is essential that we also know the different parts of the flower. I'm sure you would have learned the different parts of the flowers in lower classes. And we know that there are four parts, which we call it as four floral holes. Of the four floral holes, two we call it as non-essential part, while the two we call it as essential parts. Non-essential part includes the sepal, which together we call it as Kylix. And then another one is the petal, which together we call it as corolla. So as you can see here, the kylex or the sepal, the petal or the corolla together forms non-essential whole of the flower simply because they do not directly participate in reproduction, but they assist in reproduction. But on the other hand, you have the male part that is the androsium or the stamen which is formed by the filament and the anther as you can see here and then you have the female part the gynosium or carpel which is formed of stigma style and the solemn part called as ovary so these two the androsium and gynosium or stamen and carpel together we call it as essential part the reason is because these two parts are directly involved in reproduction. But these four parts together, we call it as floral holes. So these floral holes together constitute what we call it as flower, the reproductive part of the plant. Okay, so having looked at the different parts of the flower, let us now look at the events involved in sexual reproduction. So there are three events happening during sexual reproduction in the plant. First, we call it as pre-fertilization. Second, we call it as fertilization event. And the third, we call it as post-fertilization event. So during the pre-fertilization event, the plant prepares for fertilization by forming the male and female gametophyte. And then during the second part, that is during fertilization stage, the male and female gamete fuses together so that the fertilization happens. And then, after the fertilization, that is post-fertilization event, there will be formation of endosperm, embryogeny, which refers to conversion of zygote into embryo, and then fruit formation. So these are the three important stages happening during the reproduction in the plants. So let us look at each stage. So prior to fertilization, it is important that the male and female gametes are met to meet. So the meeting of male and female gamete, unlike in the animal, has to be assisted by some agent. The, those agent we call it as pollinating agents. So what you have to understand is, in the plant, the male gametes are produced on the anther, in the anther, while the female gametes are produced in the ovary. And these two are located in different places. So therefore, there should be somebody or some factor to transfer the pollen grain from anther to the stigma. So this process of transferring pollen grain from anther to the stigma, as you can see in the picture here, is called as pollination. So pollination is the transfer of pollen grain from anther to stigma. Let us now look at the types of pollination. In fact, there are three types of pollination. Number one, it is the kind of pollination which is happening within the same flower. That is, the pollen grain from anther gets transferred to the stigma of the same flower. 
that we call it as autogamy. And in second case, the pollination can also happen between the flowers of the same plant. So from this flower, the pollen can be transferred to the other flower born on the same plant. So that is called as gaito no gemi. It is called as gaito no gemi. So gaito no gemi refers to the pollination happening between the flowers of the same plant. So the first two type of uh, pollination we call it as self-pollination. So the self-pollination comprises of autogamy and gaitonogamy. And the third type of pollination is the pollination happening between the flowers of two different plants but of same species. If this is plant A, the pollination happens between the flowers of plant A with plant B. But the thing is, both plant A and B belong to the same species. So there are three types of pollination. So the last one is called as allogamy, the pollination happening between the flowers of different plant but of same species. And generally it is also called as cross pollination. So broadly you could classify pollination as self pollination and cross pollination. But within the self pollination, there are two types, autogamy happening within the same flowers and then gaitonogamy happening between different flowers but of the same plant. You have in fact already studied about the differences between self-pollination and cross-pollination in low classes and you have learned that the cross-pollination has advantage over self-pollination. That is why the plants have the contrivances to ensure that cross-pollination is happening. So let us now look at some of the contrivances that are found in the plant that enables cross-pollination. Number one, unisexuality. The plants, some plants are unisexual. That is, some are monoecious, some are dioecious. Monoecious plants such as maize, and pumpkin, dioecious plants such as uh, you have uh, the asparagus. So these are the examples of monoecious and dioecious. Then for those of the plants which are not monoecious and dioecious, they have another feature called as dicogamy. So in dicogamy, it is a condition where sometimes the anther will be maturing earlier than the gynoecium or sometimes the gynoecium will be maturing earlier than the androecium. So in protandry, the anther matures earlier than the gynoecium so that even if the anther produces the pollen grain, the gynoecium is not ready to receive the pollen grain. Therefore, the self-pollination is prevented and such features are seen in sylvia flowers and sunflower. But on the other hand, there are also those plants which ex exhibits the maturation of gynoecium earlier than the anther. So these, the, the plants exhibiting such features are banyan and people tree. So just an example. And in some plant, though the anther and, anther and the gynoecium, the ov ovules, might be maturing at the same time, but because the plants didn't want to undergo self-pollination, they exhibit a feature called as heterostyle. The condition where sometimes the anther is longer and the stigma is shorter. Sometimes stigma is longer and anther is shorter. And in that way, the self-pollination is prevented. So such features are seen in the primula flower, as you can see here. Then, in some plant, they exhibit a feature called as harcogamy. So, harcogamy is a condition where self-pollination is averted by physical barriers. Sometimes, the stamen is covered by the flap, like a structure, or sometimes the anther is covered by the petals, thereby not letting the pollen grain from the same flower to fall on the stigma of the same flower. 
then some flowers also exhibit a property called as prepotency. Prepotency is a condition where the pollen grain from other flowers mature earlier, grows faster than the pollen grain from the same flower. That is called as prepotency. And the sixth and last feature is self-sterility. There are also some plants such as potato and cucumber which would not be pollinated by the pollen grains of their own flower. If the pollen grains from their own flower falls, from the anther falls on the stigma, there won't be pollination happening or fertilization happening. So that is called as self-sterility. However, if the pollen grain from other flower falls there, the pollination will take place and the fertilization will also take place. So these are the six features found in different plants which try to prevent self-pollination and favors cross-pollination. So this indicates that the nature is also looking for cross-pollination and therefore you will try to find out what are the advantages of cross-pollination. You may look back to what you have studied in lower classes because today we have looked at the features found in the plant that fosters cross-pollination. So now, having looked at the pollination, and in the beginning I said that uh, unlike the animals in the plant, there should be some agent which helps in taking the pollen grains from anther to stigma within the same flower or between the different flowers of the same plant or between the flowers of different plant. So let us now look at the pollinating agents. So those things which helps in transferring pollen grains from anther to stigma are called as pollinating agents or the vectors. So the pollinating vectors could be of two types, biotic and abiotic. Biotic refers to animals which includes birds, insects, then it could also be the animals. And then a biotic includes the wind and the water. So these together we call it as pollinating agent, which helps in transfer of the pollen grains from anther to stigma of a flower. So let us look at some examples of pollinating agents. Those of the plants which are pollinated with the help of wind, we call it as anemophilae. It is called as anemophilae, wind pollinated plants. So the example of such plant is maize, which is very common. I'm sure you might have seen the maize. Anybody who did not see the maize? Okay. So if you look very carefully at the maize, you will find that you, you may think that maize do not have the flower. It indicates that uh, the flowers in the maize are not so attractive because they need not attract any pollinating agents which looks for attractive color. They are colorless. They are inconspicuous, meaning you, they are not so visible. That is why you did not see. They are very small. They do not produce good smell. They do not produce nectar. But in order to overcome all these challenges of not having the pollinating agent who looks for such feature, what the maize plant do is, they are producing the pollen grains which are light and non-sticky so that when the wind blows, the pollen grains can be scattered all over the field, thereby letting the plant around to receive the pollen grain and at the same time from the plant around, they will be able to receive the pollen grain and get pollinated. On the other hand, there are plants which are pollinated by insects. So such plants which are pollinated by insects, we call it as entomophily. They are called as entomophily, insect pollinated plants. So unlike wind, the insects and animals would not visit the flower for no reason. They will have to have the reason which is beneficial to them. So what do these flowers do? So they try to produce a very attractive color so that 
the birds or the pollinating agents or the insects will want to come and visit that flower. But after visiting the flower, do they get in turn? They get the nectar. So that is why such flowers produce a very good nectar. And then they, the pollinating agents are also like human beings. As a human, we would like to have a good smell around us. In the same way, the pollinating agents may also want to visit the flower if they have a good smell. So that is why these flowers will also produce a very good fragrance. In a way, those of the flowers which are pollinated, pollinated by such pollinating agents produces a very big flower which is conspicuous, which has a good smell and which produces good nectar. And in such flowers, the pollen grains are sticky and then they easily stick to the body of the pollinators. So, let us look at another feature of a flower, a sylvia flower as you can see here. This flower, the flower of the sylvia, is designed in such a way that there is a landing place for the insect, a bee, and then above that you can find the anther which bears the pollen grain. So when the bee sits on the on this part of the sylvia flower, you could see the bending of the anther, thereby rubbing the pollen grain at the back of the bee. And in that way, the pollen grain will be taken to the other flower of sylvia. So, that's about the pollination. Let us now look at the significance of pollination. What are the significance of pollination? So, we know that Unlike in the animals, for plants to be able to reproduce, pollination is must. Therefore, pollination is a prerequisite for fertilization. Second, it helps in combining the genes. When the genes are combined, the offspring becomes viable. So it helps to mix the genes between different plants. And then it also helps in developing hybrid seeds. So these are the three distinct uh, importance of uh, the pollination. Of course, there are other significant uh, significances as well, which you may go through. We have now finished looking at uh, the pre-fertilization ev event where the pollen grains are, has formed. Now, once the pollen grains has formed and pollination has taken place, this is how the pollen grains will land on the stigma and start moving through the style, forming a pollen tube and then into the ovary, thereby meeting with the ovule and that forms the fertilization. However, the stigma will have to receive compatible pollen grains for the pollen grain to germinate in the way you can see here. Of course, the stigma will be receiving so many kinds of pollen grains, but all the pollen grains would not germinate because the pollen grains that they receive will not be compatible. So, let us now look at the structure of a pollen grain in order to understand how the process is happening. So, here you can see the outermost part as exine, and then inner you have the intine. And there is a portion on the pollen grain which is devoid of exine and intine that we call it as germ pore. So it is, the, it is through the germ pore that the pollen tube grows. And uh, inside the pollen grain, you can see two nucleus. The bigger one, we call it as vegetative nucleus and smaller one, we call it as generative nucleus. The vegetative nucleus is also known as tube nucleus. So please bear in your mind. The pollen tube grows through germ pore. So in fact, the pollen tube is the extension of germ pore. So this is how you will be able to see the structure of a pollen grain. Now, having looked at the structure of pollen grain, let us look at the structure of ovary and ovule. This is how you are going to see the ovary and ovule if dissected and enlarged. Now, let us look at the structure of ovule 
ovule has the outer covering called as integument within the integument you could see here the nucellus which plays an important role in providing nourishment to the developing embryo till the endosperm is formed and then you can see the opening here which is called as micropyle and then on the top you could see the chalaza and then you could also see the funicle which attaches it to the ovary so let us now look at the inside part of the ovule in the inner part of the ovule you can see the three nucleus on the top which we call it as three antipodal cells and then in between you could see two these are called as polar nuclei and at the base at the opening of the micropyle you could see three this one we call it as egg cell and these two sides the lo the two located at the side we call it as synergids hope you have understood the structure of pollen grain the ovary ovule and the things that are found inside with that information let us now look at what is fertilization and how the fertilization is taking place fertilization as we know is the fusion of compatible male and female gamete which results in the production of zygote so the fertilization in the flowering plant occurs in three important steps so the first one is the germination of pollen grains on the stigma once the pollen grain fall on the stigma it will have to germinate by absorbing the moisture and nutrient from the stigma so once the pollen starts germinating second step will occur that is the pollen tube will be formed through the style and the third one is these pollen tube will run through the style and then it will enter the ovule it will enter the embryo sac and there are three ways through which it enters so that how it is entering you could refer to the refer in the textbook so firstly the pollen grain will fall on the stigma once a compatible pollen grain falls on the stigma the pollen tube will be growing as the pollen tube grows the egg nucleus the germinative nucleus will start dividing into two called egg cells and then it will run down through the pollen tube and then it will enter the embryo sac within the embryo sac the first sperm cell will be fused the second sperm cell will fuse with the polar nuclei the polar nuclei has two nucleus on top of that there is one sperm cell joining so there are three nucleus joining together so that is why we call it as triple fusion so these together constitutes double fertilization so therefore double fertilization is the fusion happening between the first male gamete with the egg cell second one second male gamete with the polar nuclei so that is the end of the fertilization so now what happens after the fertilization so after the fertilization event comes the post fertilization event so during the post fertilization event the one sperm cell that has fused with the egg cell will form the zygote and this process we call it as syngamy the fusion of one sperm cell with the egg cell is called as syngamy it forms the zygote which later grows into embryo so the process of zygote growing in uh, growing into embryo we call it as embryogeny then on the other side one sperm cell that has fused with two polar nuclei which has resulted into triple fusion is called as triple fusion only and it forms the primary endosperm 
the primary endosperm act as the source of food for the growing embryo so these two together the syngamy and triple fusion together makes the double fertilization in a flowering plant so this primary endosperm ultimately becomes the endosperm as we have discussed already so with this we come to the end of the discussion about the reproduction in flowering plant where the flower has played a very important role so let us quickly reflect back to what we have discussed so as to check whether we remember or not number one we said that the flowers are the reproductive organs of the plants number two we said that for the reproduction to happen in the plant the transfer of pollen grain is required and that transference process we call it as pollination and it happens through three ways the number three the nature has found that the cross pollination has advantage over self pollination that is why there are some plants with the different kinds of features the contrivances to ensure cross pollination we have also looked at the pollinating agents after that we discussed about the fertilization wherein we said that plants undergo the flowering plants undergo double fertilization and finally we said that double fertilization is the sum total of syngamy and triple fusion syngamy formed by the fusion of one sperm cell with the egg cell triple fusion formed by the fusion of one sperm cell with the two nucleus of polar nuclei so with this we come to the end of discussion about sexual reproduction in flowering plants and now i have a few questions for you to explore on so that you will be able to understand better on this topic number 1 of a flowering plant question number 1 question number 2 what relationship do you see between the pollinators and the flowering plant question number 3 pollination and fertilization i believe is very important and we believe is very important in ensuring food self sufficiency or food sufficiency in the world how would you explain for human being so these are the three questions on you, which you will work and lastly i would like to thank you for attending this session and i look forward to having you in my next session thank you and stay safe